what if Avatar had a spooky Halloween special? That is the question that I think is responsible for the Puppet Master's existence. An episode that did in fact air during Halloween way back in all 2007. Despite the series tackling many mature topics already, many of which we've also talked about at length before, explicit horror was always quite sparse for what I think are obvious reasons. This is still Nickelodeon after all. Though, somewhat paradoxically, I think it's exactly because of those limitations and restrictions on what you could and could not show that we got what is easily the most brutal story in Avatar, and in the space of a single episode, shows us the true horrors of a century-long war that the Fire Nation has waged. And all of that begins with the title sequence that already breaks away from the usual intro sequence, with it being accompanied by this uneasy periodic tinge with an eerie hum, one that obviously evokes that almost clock-like music that is extremely widespread in the horror genre. very neatly setting up the theme of us exploring this creepy little Fire Nation town. And that trend is continuing with the visuals as well. We open on a waxing gibbous moon, just a night before the full moon, which one, foreshadows the events of the episode as we already know that a full moon is super important for waterbenders from way back in book one, and two, further establishes the horror through the very well-established trope of lunar lunacy. The belief that a full moon messes with people's heads goes all the way back to the Middle Ages where people were said to transform into werewolves and vampires. Since then though, it has evolved to encompass all sorts of strange and in some way disturbing behaviors. So with us opening on a moon, it just subtly tells you that what we're about to witness is in some way unnatural and almost paranormal. For much of this episode, as is the case with most of Avatar, you'll notice that the overall tone is constantly yo-yoing to always keep you on your toes. We can go from what seems to be mega spooky to a wacky goofy Sokka quote to mysteries all in the space of a single sequence. Something that I think this episode in particular, especially with the horror theme, absolutely excels in. And that is best shown as we turn to our main gang. We open with just this small campfire surrounded by darkness, immediately painting them as insignificant and even further building up that anticipation as to what we're about to see and what might lurk in that darkness. That is, of course, until, in classic Avatar fashion, we are hit with the old double whammy. As this whole spooky atmosphere is entirely subverted with everyone's favorite goofball Sokka. With even that tense building music just abruptly cutting out as we cut from his very spooky story to the rest of the gang just being bored to no end. <laughs> So if you were to chart the expectations of spookiness so far, this whole subtle lead-up eventually just turned into a gag, which naturally just makes us lower our guard right away. Though just as quickly, Katara takes over and begins to tell what is actually a somewhat scary story, with it yet again being framed in what is an actual horror manner. We get these uneasy, tilted shots positioned just out of the reach of our characters, as if someone was watching just barely out of sight. Also, just to have some fun lore times, many have wondered about whether or not Katara's story about Nini actually has some canon explanation. Unfortunately though, there has been no concrete evidence as to what exactly the story is talking about. There are some clues, like Nini not having the usual schwa phoneme, perhaps indicating that she may have not even been a part of the Water Tribe, and this entire story is just an urban legend Katara's mother told her just for the old spook's sake. There's also the fact that she appeared to be blue, perhaps hinting at a darker interpretation. She passed away and came back as a spirit. But point is, it is largely up to your interpretation and there is no canon explanation. Though in the larger scope of the episode, this is exactly what I mentioned before. We yo-yo right back from Sokka's goofy story to Katara's actually eerie retelling of a tale that hits very, very close to home for them. And that is only exacerbated by Toph suddenly shooting up and saying that she can hear people under the mountain. That is then preceded with us seeing the gang through the woods, painting them as just a small, insignificant glimmering light in the all-enthralling darkness. In-universe, though, Toph's proclamation here is also, of course, incredibly important. As we know for an absolute fact that, yes, she can hear and sense things through the ground. And while the gang initially just writes it off to her being scared, out of their group, I think you'll agree that Toph is certainly not the one to be spooked by ghost stories. I mean, even when Toph herself hears people literally screaming under a mountain, she is the only one to actually be calm and composed, immediately indicating that there is actually truth to what she's saying. Something that we can obviously confirm completely with the benefit of hindsight. For the time being, however, it remains as a Chekhov's gun of sorts. 
just constantly at the back of your mind throughout the rest of this episode, and subtly reframing everything we're about to see as a potentially sinister mystery. Though yet again, that too is entirely subverted as Hama herself appears. An old lady appearing in the middle of the night in the middle of the woods is obviously very, very spooky. But that is then completely flipped on its head as we do see that she is genuinely just an innkeeper in a very nice home just serving tea to them. This isn't some, oh, follow me little kids to my lone shack in the woods. We are in the heart of a very nice small quaint village. At this point, there is very little to be worried about. And to even further cement her trustworthiness, she herself then brings up the disappearances that have been happening, urging them to be more careful. On one hand, sure you can say that it's exactly because she herself brings it up that makes her suspicious, but realistically, I think warning a group of random kids in the middle of the forest who are clearly new here of some local dangers only seems reasonable. Especially with her just trying to comfort them and saying that there's nothing to be worried about as long as they just don't wander off. Though yet again, the series baits us into thinking that something will go awry after all, with us then cutting to Sokka, who seems to have a hard time falling asleep and mentioning the constant creaking of the building. I think when we were younger, we've all had those nights where, for some reason, we're just a tad bit scared, and all of those creaks of the house that normally we wouldn't even acknowledge just seem louder and spookier and more dangerous than ever before. And this is exactly that. Though from a purely writing perspective, you would sort of expect this nighttime scene to just lead into something, right? I mean, it's not often that we get to see scenes where they just go to sleep, right? Subconsciously, you'd sort of expect Sokka's suspicions to immediately lead into some sort of spooky event in the middle of the night. But no, nothing ever happens. That too is completely subverted as his fears are quickly turned into yet another gag. As moments after saying that he wouldn't be getting any sleep at all, he is just out cold. And to drive that home even further, he is then just awoken by Katara and Hama who say that they need to go grocery shopping. So again, juxtaposing those mysteries and doubts with just about the most mundane thing imaginable. And this is what I meant when I said the episode just yo-yos in tone a lot. Every single one of these momentary spooks are followed up with a joke of some kind to just break the tension immediately. That is, of course, until it isn't. Though for now, they just go shopping and we generally see them just banter around for a bit. And also, we already see a mentor-like relationship blossoming between Katara and Hama. And like side notes, knowing that Hama is a waterbender, I can't help but think that this line I think you and I are going to get along swimmingly is meant to be a very, very punny joke, so good job there, I guess. But anyway, just like Hama warning them the night before, we hear the locals talking about the full moon, which one, lends more credence to Hama's story and her trustworthiness, as again, she herself warned the gang about it, and two, sort of paints it as a normal occurrence that the locals just prepare for. It's basically the PG version of the purge for them, you know? And like you'd expect, because this is the world of Avatar, Sokka immediately says that this is probably just some spirit world shenanigans. Something that we have already explicitly seen during the Winter Solstice way back in Book 1. Obviously, we have had a myriad of smaller villains in Avatar already. So technically, there is a reason to suspect that this might be a person after all. But at the same time, the events of what's going on here are in no way connected to Aang's arrival. Not only that, these are literally just completely random inhabitants of a small town. So all of this just naturally leaves you asking questions as to what is truly going on here, while also building toward that fateful night with just another reminder that we are just a day away from the full moon. Though to again dry up that spookiness, when Sokka mentions that it's a weird town, Hama says the totally not creepy at all line of Mysterious town for mysterious children. Which to me, results in some pretty serious cognitive dissonance as to what I want to believe. Yes, old spooky lady is certainly a horror trope, and this episode is very much poised as a horror special. But at the same time, at literally every single turn, that mystery is entirely subverted by your usual Avatar shenanigans. In that sense, Sokka sort of fills the role of us as the audience, with him immediately falling to his usual detective role of overthinking things and eventually getting into trouble, while Katara just tries to pull him back a little bit and just make sure that, you know, he doesn't get into trouble. But as is also often the case, while Sokka is certainly a goofball, he is also a literal genius. So in this case, he does very much turn out to be right. Well, right to an extent. And before we get to that, whoever decided to have this cabbage that literally looks like Grand Grand while Katara mentions her is an absolute genius and frankly deserves a raise. Like seriously, look at it. 
Though continuing in his investigation, Sokka then begins to snoop around and quickly finds a whole bunch of puppets, very much proving his suspicions of there being more to this lady than we thought. And while Katara tells him it's just a hobby and nothing to get worked up about, considering the theme of this episode, it is, like, literally the biggest red flag imaginable, as, you know, she does turn out to be a literal puppet master? Though notice how this is framed, because the dolls, while certainly creepy, aren't locked behind some doors or anything like that. They simply stumble upon these doors and they pop out. What's far more interesting, however, is that directly after that, there is actually a hidden room. And notice how we've now switched from that mischievous music we heard just a moment ago as Sokka began snooping around. Sokka? Sokka, what are you doing? You can't just snoop around- To a far slower and eerie tune. We'll see. It's empty except for a little chest. And for like the 30th time in this episode, our expectations are once again being messed with. We go from finding some spooky spooky dolls just out in the open, but we then find a hidden room with a ominous chest and are also caught by the supposedly creepy lady. But yet again, all of it just turns out to be a family heirloom and revealing the fact that she is actually a waterbender, with the dolly zoom here emphasizing the sheer shock of this reveal. Suddenly, all the spookiness and secrecy is completely recontextualized. Because yes, we are meeting a waterbender from their hometown in the literal heart of the Fire Nation. Obviously, she would like to keep her heritage a secret, right? I mean, we totally understand that. As we already saw with Bato, who is also referenced with Aang saying that he doesn't like sea prune soup, by the way, there is a lot of just inherent loyalty in the Water Tribe. So yes, at this point, we are best buddies. And now that the mystery around her has been somewhat demystified, we get to her backstory. And it's here where things get very, very interesting. First off, it introduces just what is one of very few waterbenders we see in the series. It's easy to forget, but aside from Paku and the swamp benders, waterbenders have been very sparse throughout, so meaning one in, again, the heart of the Fire Nation is already eyebrow raise worthy. Also, it finally goes full circle and elaborates on why there were literally no waterbenders in the southern tribe. And not only that, it shows us the iconic ship we would eventually wander into all the way back in episode 1. Though at this point, obviously Hama is contextualized as 100% an ally. She shares history with Sokka and Katara, we literally saw a version of what she lived through, so naturally, we empathize with everything she is saying. And notice how when we cut to the next morning and see Hama teaching Katara, we have that sort of Iroh motif. Totally at home, surrounded by snow and ice and seas. But Water is the element of change. The it's this old, wise bender sharing their insights that will largely reshape bending as we know it. With Iroh, he talked about how lightning redirection is derived from water benders, something that very much shifts how we think about bending on a fundamental level. Hama, on the other hand, pushes what we've already seen with water bending to its absolute limits, saying that water can be drawn from absolutely everything, including air itself. This completely recontextualizes a very important aspect of water bending. Thus far, elements like fire bending and air bending always seem to have a definitive edge in that they can be effectively conjured out of nothing, right? Earthbenders could be limited by metal, until Toph changed that, of course, and waterbenders could be limited by dry environments. Well, with Hama, we finally answer the question that has likely popped into everyone's mind at some point. How far can you truly push bending? This sort of thinking is something we see explored further in Korra as well. But, you know, there is air in your lungs. 60% of you is water, and around 2% of you are metals and minerals. So, does bending also extend to that? Not to talk about Korra here, but we've already seen Monkey Atso and a lot of those corpses, right? So, did he suffocate everyone with some sort of vacuum bubble? And also notice the complete tonal shift that happens when Hama mentions this. We go from that Uncle Iroh mentor type chill vibe I mentioned before, to an abrupt and almost combative tenseness. But did you know you can even pour water out of thin air? There's water in places you never think about. And also note how right after this, we smash cut to Aang and Sokka trying to investigate the disappearances. But Aang then says that he doesn't see anything that could upset the spirits, further hinting toward the true enemy behind all of this. But returning to Hama and Katara, we see another very cheeky scene of foreshadowing. They briefly talk about how Katara met a man using the water within vines to control them and whatnot. 
but Hama then demonstrates the ability to draw water from all the fire lilies in their vicinity. I do admit this might be a case of me overanalyzing a little, but later in the series, the Sun Warriors would talk about how fire represents life and the fire burning within all people. So to me, Hama drawing all the water or life from the fire lilies and forcing them to just wither away is a visual representation of that dark side of her bending. With the following shot, literally framing them as almost burnt. For the first time in the series, we truly see that each and every element can be just as destructive as fire. So I think portraying these withered away flowers as blackened and burnt is a very deliberate choice. More on this in a second. And before we follow up with our two waterbenders, we then cut on over to Sokka's investigation as they find Old Man Ding. Here too, we of course see the usual Avatar shenanigans of horror mixed with wacky, goofy characters. But at this point, they obviously learn where the people are being held and free them soon thereafter. Though a smaller detail I loved here is how we see Ding actually play out what happens, with him literally moving like a doll with its strings being pulled. Because one, it's just really cool and spooky, but number two, it is a deliberate callback to the dolls we already saw back in Hama's house. So now it turns out that the innkeeper of the town, someone who's obviously at the very heart of the locals, is a puppet master in more ways than one, with the entire town simply being her puppets. Though with that, we jump back on over to Katara and Hama, where immediately the scene is being framed as a standoff with that typical slightly canted panning shot looking up at the two rivals. And as we get to Hama actually explaining the lore behind her power, we are finally introduced to what is easily the most terrifying bending art in Avatar, bloodbending. If you've read basically any other fantasy story, you'll know that there is always some sort of dark magic or just full-blown blood magic. It's just one of those things that is so gruesome and insidious that just naturally feels very taboo. I mean, practically speaking, getting hit by a massive fireball is likely far worse. But it doesn't matter because we as humans are just terrified of not being in control. Bloodbending is literally that. Stripping you of all control and turning you into a mindless puppet. A prisoner within your own skin. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter what you want or feel. It doesn't even matter who you think your allies are. Because at that very moment, you are in the grasp of someone else with Hama literally snapping up Aang, the literal avatar, along with everyone else in the space of a few seconds. And also notice how Hama's obsession with power of the full moon is very evocative of Ozai and Sozin's comets. Only difference being that Sozin's comets was this extremely rage-filled, passionate, and explosive form of power, while bloodbending is a far more cold and almost insidious form of bending. There is no destruction, no rage. It is cold, meticulous, and almost like lightning, quite literally destroys the enemy from the inside out. Hama's philosophy on bloodbending is also something that is worth exploring, with her saying that the power exists, so you must use it or someone will use it against you. Effectively saying that mutually assured destruction is the only real form of deterrence. Here it doesn't really matter whether it's bloodbending or lightning generation or whatever, it's more so the idea that matters. To her, saying that this power is in some way bad or shouldn't be used is just naive because her enemies never considered anything to be quote-unquote bad. Here we could dive super deep into the historical background of this conversation and banned weapons of mass destruction and other things like that. But even on a surface level, especially in a story like Avatar that, don't forget, literally has had an entire nation wiped out in a centrally long war, I think you'll agree that this debate around whether or not you should use this power is not one that you can really easily disregard. And while Katara grapples with this decision, Hama effectively forces Katara to accept that power through the same way she did. She inflicts the same pain on Katara that she experienced herself. And here, we have to take another step back because this also completes the trend of showing us that all benders of all nations, no matter their backgrounds, can be evil. In a lot of series aimed at younger audiences, morality will usually be depicted as largely black and white. For this little thought exercise, think of the Fire Nation as a whole. Forget about Zuko, Iroh, and everyone else like that, just think about them as a concept. They started this war, their schools are posed as mindless propaganda, their children have to abide by these extremely strict rules, their rulers are not the least bit worried to even go after spirits, etc, etc. But throughout the story, this fundamental belief is also questioned many, many times. 
and we are constantly reminded that these generalizations are always flawed. In Book 1, we have Zhao, an obvious baddie. But at the same time, we are introduced to his literal teacher Zhang Zhang, and he is nothing like his pupil. So right from the get-go, no, the Fire Nation isn't pure evil and all the other nations aren't pure good. Even once closely related people can take drastically different paths. And then we have Book 2. In the very first episode, we have General Fong. Someone who was ready to push Aang beyond his limits to try to awaken the Avatar state. Not because of some malice, but just because of a lack of empathy and tunnel vision. So while he may not be a bad dude per se, he isn't a very good dude either. And then of course we have very explicit antagonists in the Dai Li and Long Feng. With Ba Sing Se being just as, if not more indoctrinated as the Fire Nation. So again, Earthbenders can also be evil. And now we have Hama. Someone who shares so much of her roots with Katara and Sokka. Yet their paths could not have been more different. Katara was ready to use her super special spiritual water on Zuko's scar. Literally the person that had been chasing them down for the better part of a year. While Hama is indiscriminately and methodically going after every single random civilian in their town with absolutely no rhyme or reason. It's just the usual saying of no one's born evil. Both were born in the same tribe. Both lost people to the Fire Nation. Both were forged through fire. Only Hama was just pushed beyond her breaking points. And eventually became just as bad, if not worse, since again she is targeting completely innocent civilians as the people who came after her. And then when it comes to their actual battle, notice how the waterbending is being portrayed. All of waterbending was usually soothing and flowing. Get it? Flowing? Because water flows? Yet here, it is utterly destructive. They are ripping apart trees, their water blasts crashing against one another exactly like that of firebending. And I also love how fast and snappy this fight is. These are two masters fighting under a full moon after all. Each and every one of these strikes are precise and devastating. Not a single bit of power is being wasted here. Though the absolute best part here is easily the complete thematic 180 we see as Hama launches Aang and Sokka toward one another. Just how abruptly all that battle music cuts out and we only hear this distant, almost sorrowful hum. It perfectly captures that sort of deal with the devil Katara was forced to make to save her friends. On the face of it, I mean, yeah, she bloodbent Hama, right? What's the big deal? But no. In universe, that is not something you just forget. It is the darkest form of bending that changes you on a fundamental level. The moment you indulge in that power that can literally control someone, there is no coming back from that. Something that we do later see on full display as Katara and Zuko pursue the Southern Raiders. Much like Hama, we see her use that absolute power to bend people to her will, forcefully throwing the firebender to his knees with even Zuko doing a double take upon seeing it. Likely also counting his blessings that he never came face to face with this version of Katara. Eventually though, we would see how their diverging paths also led them to different ends. With Katara choosing to spare the man after all, not because she forgave him, but rather because she realized there is no point in killing him. Seeing him offer up his mother in place of his own life tells Katara everything she needs to know. This man is no more than an empty husk, so in many ways, there is no greater punishment than just simply leaving him be. But point is, despite her clearly never wanting to use this power ever again, she did. It is now forever a part of her. And so, that victory over Hama is just so, so bittersweet. With her also saying, My work is done. You're a bloodbender. It's just that final, oh, you thought you'd won. No, you did exactly what I wanted. You are still merely my puppets. The moment when you realize that everything you've done was just a part of some grander scheme, and you are no more than just some rat in a maze is absolutely terrifying. And I think Hama captures that flawlessly. She is easily one of the most ruthless characters we ever see in the series, and her unrelenting obsession with revenge against the Fire Nation as a whole, even going as far as to strike back at her own roots with the excuse of making them stronger, is just, well, yikes. And those final shots of us focusing on the full moon, very much emphasizing that madness and horrors that just transpired, all of that easily makes the Puppet Master the scariest episode in Avatar.
And that's the video. And I guess that is also our little horror duology wrapped up. Unless I move on to Legend of Korra. As my excitement slowly builds toward the inevitable Netflix trailer on the horizon, you can certainly expect a whole lot more Avatar in the future. And I still need to get around to making that Book 3 tier list video too, so, you know. Wild to think that it's been two years since I put out the last one. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye